I think everybody in this room has felt at some point in life like there has to be more than what my day-to-day -day is. There has to be more. Even as a Christian, sometimes we get stuck in just the day. And we can tell something's gone missing from our lives, but the question is, and the search is, well, for what? And what I would say is more than missing, what has happened is something's been stolen from us. Because we have an enemy, and that enemy, of all the things he hates, he hates our intimacy with God. It's what he's lost forever by his choice, and he hates when God's creation has fellowship with him. And so a lot of what's in our life that feels like it's missing, it's actually been stolen. And that has a huge impact on how we live and how we love other people, how we relate, how we worship, and our gifting, our creativity. We're going to talk a lot about creativity in the next few minutes, but let me just tell you now, every single person in this room is creative and has a unique, specific gift talent. And it may not feel very creative yet by the way the world defines it, but we're going to go into that. And what's missing is a direct assault on that. So our quest is going to be, let's discover what's missing and let's realize why it's so essential to everything we do and who we are. For those of you who have read the story of With, the protagonist's name is Mia. And I don't say this in the book, but the reason I named Mia Mia is because the initials are MIA, missing in action. So she is a prototype of all of us. In other words, we're all a little bit missing in action in our own story. We all are a little foggy on why we're here, on what God's motive is in our story, on how our story's gonna play out, on what chapter we're in in our story. In that sense, we're all a little bit missing in action. And that's why I created that character, is just to re represent us in that search. So Mia, she's lost her story. She's forgotten her true identity. And she's basically living like an orphan. And by an orphan, I mean she's forgotten that God is her father. She's never really known what it is to be a daughter of a father. And most Christians, I believe, most Christians know God in terms of knowing knowledge about him, but they don't really know him as a father. And so part of our search and quest is to get to see and know God in a new way, because we're just like her. And the goal is to remember. So tonight, I want to be like smelling salts. I want it to be a sense that you have when you leave this room of, for some, oh yeah, that is who God is. That is what he's inviting me into. And for others, maybe it's a first glimpse of God in a way that's not so much the religious God, but it's the intimate God, the creator God. So to do that, we're gonna to have to relearn our story, capital S, meaning your life story. And we're gonna talk about how we relearn our story. But this is gonna be, the word up here may be a little bit unexpected to you. We have to respect our story. And by that, let me add a hyphen in there. Respect means to see in a new way, to re-see. We're gonna re-see our stories and actually we'll have more respect for our stories and what God's doing when we do that. So we're gonna go into our stories because the first step to seeing with new eyes, and this is a quote from the book, is letting go of the belief that your current reality is the only reality. It's easy to believe sometimes that what makes up our day is really what makes up our life. So we've got to go to the grocery store and we've got to pick up the kids and we've got to run an errand and the battery goes out in our car and the boss is mad and life is hard and it's one thing after another. 
But that's not our truer story. That's not what we've really been invited into. It's parts of our day, but it's not the truer part of our life or who we are. So we're going to learn to see with new eyes. Jeremiah 33.3 is one of my favorite passages. Call to me and I will show you great things you cannot know on your own. Now, the part of the verse I used to remember most was the first part. Call to me and I'll show you great things. Cool. That's a, that's a big invitation. And that's a great invitation. But the second part, I think, is the most critical. Things you cannot know on your own. In other words, I'll show you great things if you do life with me. But you have to do it with me. If you're not with me, you'll miss the great things. I'll show my sons and daughters things as they do life together with me. That's the promise of Jeremiah 33, 3. And that's what we're going to dive into. Another way to say that, and a famous explorer once made this comment, and he said, to experience the fantastical, we must be willing to go to fantastic places. In other words, if we're sitting on our couch eating potato chips, we're probably not going to get to many fantastical things in our lives. We're probably not going to have much breakthrough. We're probably not going to be living the kind of story that draws us closer to God, where miracles happen, where the unimaginable, unexpected happens, because we haven't brought ourselves to a place where we need that. If we live in a safe, small story, there's not a lot of need for God to come through. And God loves to come through. But we have to allow ourselves to be in a fantastical place. The Red Sea won't part for us if we're not standing before the Red Sea. The lion's mouths won't be closed if we're not in a den of lions, in a pit with the lions. Like we have to allow ourselves to be in a place where if God doesn't come through, we don't know what's going to happen before we see God fully come through. He rarely comes through while we're on the couch eating potato chips. So let's begin by asking God to take us back to the beginning. And that's starting by seeing our story in mythic terms. In a mythic level, what is the theme of your life right now? What is the theme of your story, the one you're living right now from a mythic perspective? And it's okay if you don't know that yet. But that's the question. That's where I want us to start seeing our lives. Yes, you're in the middle of finding a new home. Yes, you're having trouble with a child at home. Yes, these things are real and important. And what is God doing on a mythic level with your story? We read Old Testament Bible stories so often when we're kids and, and their morality tells. Right? David and Goliath, face your giants, a story of facing your giants. But if you were David in the middle of that and somebody grabbed you by the arm right when you were going out to fight Goliath and said, hey, 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 um, I think your whole life is some tale that people 2,000 years from now are going to say it's just facing giants on a big level, like whatever that means. I think he would look at you like, you're crazy, like this. I'm, I'm actually, this is a real story with me facing a real issue that could kill me in the next two seconds. Like, my whole life isn't condensed to a two-second morality tell. It, it's more. Your story is more than some moment you're living in with a to-do list. But what is that story? What is the chapter? What is the, the chapter right now you're in? It's really worth asking and knowing because in that, you start to see God. You start to see the bigger story. There's a um, wine company that makes this wine called True Myth. And I just love the label because whether you drink wine or not, I think it's a great way of saying this is kind of the two words that describe our lives. 
a myth, epic, and yet true. It's a story that's true. It's mythic. Your story is more than you see. And that's really what we're talking about here is me standing here as a fellow man on his journey, fellow son of God, saying, guys, yes, you're doing what you do really well during the day and in, in the occupation that you have. And there is so much more. We have forgotten what God has invited us into. Like our goal, I think, is to live the kind of lives that if the world keeps going for another 500 years, kids are reading our stories at bedtime. If they're reading your story 200 years from now, what, what would it be? He was a man who loved crossword puzzles and made it home for dinner on time every night or he balanced the budget sheet or she was a successful accountant. Like those are not bad things, they're good needed things, but what would your story be on a mythic, epic level? Because that's what God's inviting us into. That's why he has us here. None of our stories are boring with God. None of our stories are dull when we're with him. We just have to remember who we are. A quote from my book says, every hero's journey, including ours, reaches that moment where we either cling to the known or move into mystery. The hero's journey for writers is this cycle that says, every great story has these main specific elements. And once you read what the hero's journey is and what those elements are, you'll never look at a movie the same again. Because whether it's Star Wars, or whether it's a classic from the 1950s, or whether it's a romance, they all tend to have these specific same beats to it. And they do because our story does as well. Somebody didn't make up the hero's journey as a model, they actually observed how our lives are. And then they saw what, what really made sense in a, in a story that was written for the movies or for a book. And in a movie, we know things are about to get good when Harrison Ford in Indiana Jones steps onto that rope bridge and he's in the middle of it. And all of a sudden, men with swords, the bad guys, show up on that side and on this side. And he's in the middle. And it's hundreds of feet below. Like as, as movie watchers, we lean in, we're excited. We know this is a good part. In our life, if you find yourself on a rope bridge <laughs> and guys come up on either side about to, to cut the ropes, you're probably not excited. You're probably having a panic attack <laughs> and it's not your favorite scene of your life. I get it, but what I'm saying is Oftentimes we miss in our own life a chance to have a more epic, mythic experience because we try to avoid risk. We run from things that require too much of us, we think, or that risk too much. In a movie, we love it. In our life, we fear it. But what if we saw our life more as an adventure with God where we don't, I'm not saying take foolish risk, I'm not saying do crazy things just so God will pull you out of it. What I'm saying is when you're walking with God, he will invite you into more. And that more is something we need to savor when we're in it. Even in the hard times, a lot of times Kelly and I, um, this is Kelly, my wife right here. So Kelly and I, People will ask us, since we moved to Colorado five or six years ago, how are things going? And usually the short answer we'll give is, it's really good and it's really hard. It's both. It's both. God invited us into it, we know, and it's been good. So many good things. And it's been hard. So many harder things than where we were. 
but we know we're in the story that God has us in. And it is mythic. So start to see your life from a bigger perspective. The journey is to remember and recover your particular story. Your story, and we're going to go into, especially tomorrow, what does it mean to, to go deeper and see your story in some different ways? But the first step is this, is knowing there are two realms. Now, in the story of With, early in the book, the protagonist finds that there are two different realms, the orphan realm and the freedom realm. The orphan realm's not good. Freedom realm is really good. And so I'm going to go over what these two realms are because, again, seeing our life in a mythic way, this is a great way to decide which realm you're living in. Because we all live and create within one of these two. You can't be in both. I don't believe. I believe you're in one or the other. So think of a realm as a place you exist. Okay, a realm is, in simplest terms, the place you exist. It's an atmosphere from which you interpret your life. It's the lens or the grid from which you see everything. And it also affects how others feel when they're around you. So if, if you were to take a road trip with your best friend and it was a 12 hour road trip, imagine how that would be in a car, probably Conversation, laughter, fun, joy time would probably pass pretty quickly. And now imagine if it was that coworker that you actually walk the other way when you see them in the hall because you know it's going to be an awkward conversation. And imagine 12 hours on that car ride. The atmosphere has changed dramatically. Same mileage, same scenery, same vehicle, but something's changed the atmosphere. Okay. Part of that is whether that person is living in the orphan or in the freedom realm. So let's talk about the orphan realm for a second. Okay, so those in the orphan realm, well, what do they feel like? Well, they tend to feel overwhelmed most of the time. They're easily offended. They're weary a good bit of the time. They're often disheartened and they kind of feel alone. And you can feel alone in a marriage and in a house with three kids. And you can feel alone when you're in an apartment by yourself. Okay, it's a feeling. But that's how those in the orphan realm tend to feel. Here's a picture. If I could, des if I could just describe it in a visual, it's a person with a lot of baggage literally, who can't really see where they're going, trying to hold it all together, things are coming apart, and it just looks like they're going to collapse at any moment. They're doing the best they can to hold it all together. But it's, it's an uneasy, overwhelming feeling, whether that's financial, or whether that's other issues, or whether that's relational things, or all of them, that's a picture of somebody symbolically in the orphan realm. In the orphan realm, the people there live without much hope and without really deep friendships. They strive, they blame, they compete, they compare, and they control. In other words, most of it is based on external measurements. You won't hear people in the orphan realm talk much about the heart or the deeper life in any way. The only way to be more in the orphan realm is to do more. I was under that trap for a long time in my corporate life where the best way to earn my boss's approval was to do more, to work longer hours, to get in early, to stay late, to make a name for myself, to work harder than the other person. It's an orphan mindset because there's never an end. Whatever you're doing now needs to increase. Unfortunately, a lot of marriages are like this too. You're more loved the more you do. A lot of friendships are that way. 
It's an orphan mindset. And over time, we start chasing the approval of others rather than our dreams. In fact, we kind of in the orphan realm forget what our dreams even were. And we're just simply trying to not topple the apple cart. The orphan realm also is big if you want to write these three words down. Formula, deadlines, and duty are huge with an orphan mindset. So how does that look with God? Well, instead of intimacy with God, which can be really inefficient, right? Like to, to know God is not a quick, fast, two minute a day devotional and a memory verse. That may know, you may know more about God, but you won't know God well with that formula. God never tends to have his sons and daughters in scripture, the people that we read about, solve a problem the same way twice. He never seems to have a formula because he wants relationship. But in the orphan realm, formulas are big, deadlines are big, and I know we all have deadlines, but we just need to remember the word deadline really basically means we're drawing a line of death around something. So it's hard to have a lot of life when your life is based on lines of death or deadlines constantly. And duty is big there. Now, the God of the orphan realm is seen as harsh, distant, unreliable. Believe in God. I hope he's not mad at me. I'm going to try to do better. And the God of the orphan realm is primarily a teacher. Now, yes, God teaches us lessons. He's a teacher. But the primary goal of God with sons and daughters is not that we learn to master a lesson. God is a teacher, but he's first a father. And it would be the equivalent of, for those of you who have kids, later to say, if there was one thing I wanted my kid to know about me as a dad, as a mom, was that I taught a really good lesson and that I would not be pleased until they mastered it. Yikes. I hope that's not what you'd want your child to remember about you most, even though you do teach lessons. God is not primarily somebody waiting for us to learn a lesson. I, I was at a, a large group about a year ago, and, and one of the people there said, yeah, I'm going through a really hard time, and I guess God's just trying to teach me something. And until I learn whatever that lesson is, I guess it's, I'm going to stay in this position. And we had a, a really good chance to talk to, to that person and say, I don't think that's God's personality. Like, that's not primarily who God is. Because if he is, then if you're a student in the orphan realm, your whole goal is just to memorize facts, tips, and techniques. I think some of the worst teachers are the teachers that only want kids to memorize things, but they don't have relationship or help them learn things. And that's not how God is with us. Okay, God wants us to experience, to learn, to grow, to mature. People in the orphan realm live and pursue life as if it's all up to them. If I succeed, it was up to me. And if I fail, well, gosh, it's my fault. But whatever it is, it's in their own strength. And that's why I say it's a realm of fierce independence. Now, America and Texas especially, of all states, I'm a Texas native, okay? And independence can be really good. But God isn't trying to raise independent sons and daughters. He's trying to raise sons and daughters who depend on him and who grow in maturity and in fierce mastery of who they are. So there's freedom and independence, but the goal isn't to do life on our own. The goal isn't to be a lone ranger. And finally, it's a land of scarcity. There's winners and there's losers in the orphan realm. It's not a place where there's plenty for everybody. You have to fight for what you get. And it's hard to celebrate somebody else's victory because it's seen as your loss or your shortcoming, or it's offense because, God, why, like, what about me? Bill Johnson, the pastor at Bethel, has this great quote, anything built by self-promotion 
has to be sustained by self-promotion. If you're living in the orphan realm and you're continually spinning a lot of plates, yes, it's stressful because you can't stop because it's all up to you. There are plates you've set in motion and if you stop and the plates crash, well, then it's all up to you. So anything built with self-effort has to be sustained by self-effort. And guys, in the orphan realm, like everybody wants to experience success, but what is success when you're living in that type of environment? Basically, it's actually failure because success means you've somehow momentarily done it on your own and now do more on your own and now do more on your own and now do more on your own. That's the orphan realm. And it's mastering life kind of without God. George MacDonald, the Scottish theologian, has this incredible quote where he says, without God, man, men or women, must fail miserably or succeed even more miserably. Isn't that a powerful quote? Like, if, you, if it's without God, even success is failure. The orphan realm is a realm, and you can put in all capital letters, of without. Now, a lot more fun to talk about the freedom realm, okay? And we're laying this foundation because this shorthand is going to be how we talk about so much. The freedom realm, those who live in the freedom realm, okay, it's, it's a place where there's peace, there's hope, there's joy, there's desire, not all the time, not 24 seven, but that, those are the defining ways that people there feel. When something happens, their immediate sense is not, well, whose fault is it? Who can I blame? I'm offended. Oh my gosh, this is terrible. Okay, that, that's the orphan realm. In the freedom realm, there's a sense of, it's gonna be okay. Like it, We'll figure it out. God, I wonder what God's up to in this is a big phrase in the freedom realm when you're facing something. I wonder what God's up to here. Yes, there's an enemy. I'm a son or daughter. I wonder what God's up to in this. The residents there live intimately and actively with God. And they've relinquished this illusion of control. As, as a younger man, I used to believe, I had this deep down belief, if I just could do a little more each day, I could finally control my world. Like, if I could control a little today and a little more tomorrow and get a little more on the to-do list done the next day and stop this from happening and keep this in line, eventually I'd have pretty much control over my life and have it the way I wanted. Can anybody relate? Yeah. <laughs> and it was a, and, and it, what it does is it shrinks your story smaller and smaller because really we don't control much of anything. There's a few, we can make decisions and, and we have choices, but we can't even control if we're gonna wake up after we go to sleep tonight. So residents here have given up that illusion of control. They no longer need to have all the answers. A question to ask yourself in the journal that you can go back to with God later is, how well do you do with the unknown? How much can you rest in questions are the unknown. You know, faith is great if you have it at the end, but faith isn't really needed so much at the victory party as it is in the not yet. It's really not faith if you're stressed the whole time you're going through something and then you see how it ends and you're good. Because it's okay. Th that's not really faith. An agnostic would feel that way. Okay? You no longer need all the answers while you're going through something in the freedom realm. In the book, I say it this way. Do we hunger more for guarantees or do we hunger more for God? Because God rarely gives us guarantees. We have some long-term guarantees, 
We have promises, but he doesn't guarantee the details of every moment of your day. But we know we have him in those. But which do we long for most? A day, if, if somebody said, you know, hey, Riley, I'm going to give you a choice. I'm just making up a name out of the blue here. <laughs> hey, Riley, I, I'll give you a choice. You can have today. I'll guarantee you everything will go incredibly well today. Everything. Whatever you do, it's going to go incredibly well. I guarantee it. Or no guarantees of anything, but God will be with you through everything. Absolutely. Which one has the bigger pull? So, in the freedom realm, the pull is, I'll take God over the guarantees. The residents there see God as a good father, yes, a teacher, but primarily a good father. Which means they get to live primarily not as students or slaves, but as sons and daughters. Life isn't all up to them. The only way in this realm, it flips. The only way to do is to be more. You actually get a lot done, but it starts from a place of being, not doing. The foundation is who you are, not what you do. It flips it from the orphan realm. And in the freedom realm, they get to answer this question. Who would you be if the world didn't already tell you who you are? Because from early in our lives, the world tells us who we are. The world tries to define us. The enemy tries to tell us who we are and who we're not. But in the freedom realm, we get to base our identity on who God says we are. And it's a realm of fierce dependence, and that's a good thing. Fierce dependence. Life becomes a shared adventure with God. Residents in this realm prefer to live by mystery and faith over formula. Always a combination, right? To have faith, there has to be some mystery. If there's no mystery, what do you need to have faith in? Like it's angels don't need to have faith that God is real. They're looking at God face to face. Faith isn't needed in that sense. We need faith here for what's unseen. Faith in mystery, not formula though. It's a realm of with. Which of those two realms, not by the name, because we'd all pick freedom over orphan, but by the character traits, what would somebody who knows you or works next to you, which realm would they say you're living in? Which realm would somebody that is an acquaintance say you live in based on your freedom, your joy, your offense, your focus on internal or external, how you handle crisis and questions and unknown, which realm feels more like home? Because we can only invite others into the realm that we're living in. And I think this is a, honestly a big problem with a lot of churches. They know scripture, they know about God, and there's so much striving and competition and uncertainty and offense and rigidness that they're stuck in an orphan realm. And those churches over time die because God doesn't spend a lot of time in the orphan realm other than to help people leave. But he doesn't help a church grow this thriving as orphans. Same with schools, same with companies, same with ministries, same with families. We can only invite our children into what we're living. You can't really live as orphans full time and help your kids see freedom.